You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics and how they all unfold, we'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the conference board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the conference board and the host of this podcast series. And in today's conversation, we're going to discuss the future of cities. Has the pandemic and remote work changed the long-term outlook for urban centers in the US and around the world? And then what's the next chapter for our major cities? Joining me today is an expert on this subject, Alex Heil, the senior economist here at the conference board. Alex, welcome. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. So, Alex, you know, the, the this pandemic has changed everything, of course, and, and it, it certainly has affected uh, urban areas. You know, office space uh, is underutilized. People have moved uh, and are able to work remotely. Talk about the disruptions and how much of it is temporary versus permanent? Yes, I think when we consider urban environments in a post-COVID world, it's it's important to look at the overall trend. So the trend starting even before the pandemic has one in which, you know, cities were attractive, but there was a net out- outflow of people from urban areas to some lower cost city centers and some suburban um, spaces. And that certainly increased you know exponentially during the pandemic i think the rate of outflow increased by about uh, you know a factor of 3 now that has normalized but now in a post covid world we're still faced with the same situation in which you know some of the expensive coastal urban areas are seeing especially those are seeing an outflow of of uh, of residents and uh, i think there are several different challenges and the challenges are both on the way that assets are utilized. So this comes back to transportation. How are we using transportation and infrastructure in general? This this is an issue of asset utilization. You mentioned commercial real estate, the extent to which businesses and firms will demand space, not just in 2022, but over the next years, and the extent to which urban downtowns are attractive and what that's what does that mean for retail sales for business for um business activity and economic activity in general yeah you know these trends have ebbed and flowed especially in the u.s you know pre-world war ii we were largely you know either agrarian or dense urban areas and then post-world war ii there was this massive flight to the suburbs and that developed, you know, for a very long time until you started to see urban centers come back and the young, uh, the younger generation come back. Now, this this is a whole different dynamic here. How much of this do you think is permanent versus temporary? Well, I think you know now, basically at the end of 2022, I think we can safely say that some of these trends are permanent. It appears that. The work from home trend driven in part by changes in preference, changes in expectation, as well as businesses responding to their workforce appears like to to have shifted to a new equilibrium. If you look at some of the data, the data suggests that depending on which urban area you're looking at, you know, anywhere between 45 and 65 percent of workers in the office. And if you think about what this means, economically speaking, you know, the peak demand is in, there might just still be the case that most people are in the office maybe on a Tuesday, Thursday schedule, but that leaves a lot of days that are underutilized with very few workers. So I think that is going to, businesses will have to respond to that. And they are thinking about, and they're planning about how much real estate they're going to need. And what does that actually mean in terms of the volatility or the number of people that are going to be in the office on any given day of the week? And I think that's going to provide challenges going forward. But I do think that that is now the the standard, essentially. I think that businesses are now attracting workforce in an environment with vast labor shortages, especially for some professions. That will um, That is driving some of this. And in addition, 
two and a half years of a pandemic environment has taught workers that the remote um, work setup is desirable, that some collaboration with their colleagues in the office is good and productive, but at the same time, long commutes are, you know, they're not as, uh, they're not as attractive as they once were or not as necessary, not as needed. And, and I can certainly speak, uh, you know, from personal experience when it comes to that. So Alex, let me come back on this issue of equilibrium because so much has changed and you know there is this flow back as you said towards the the workplace and maybe two days a week. Are we there? You know, is this the new the new reality, the new you know the new equilibrium or or do you think the pendulum will continue to swing back even more? Oh Steve, that's a good point. I think that it might be a little, you know, early to say if we're really at this if we've arrived at a new equilibrium, I think ultimately um, this is, you know, we're, we're having people in the back in the office and that's for two, three days a week. I think at this point is also important to note that this only applies to people that can actually work remotely, which is the professional type office worker. So that's not the entire labor market, certainly. Um, and then going forward, I think it will be, there's sort of a push-pull effect, I think. So there is the, you know, the economy might slow. And in our forecast, we have a somewhat mild recession built into the baseline early next year. I think that could be a factor that pulls people more into the office. But at the same time, there's a factor, you know, that, you know, we, we have identified as a labor shortages across a variety of different professions, different industries, different sectors. And so businesses need to compete. They need to compete for workers. And the the attractiveness of a job to a certain extent is now also can be characterized by the ability to work remotely as see at least a certain a certain number of days a certain number of hours per week so i do think that you know the rate of change has slowed for between certainly the spring summer of 2022 and now the fall and um, economic conditions may swing it a little bit more but i think that this is going to slowly find a way of of balancing now between those two poles yeah, and you know, you mentioned um, the difference between the impact on commercial real estate versus residential real estate. Talk a little bit more about that because there, you know, I'm hearing numbers like fifty percent of commercial real estate in the urban centers is being is not being utilized, and yet there, you know, there's a shortage apparently of residential real estate in the urban areas. Yeah, I think this is this is a real. Um... A real conundrum for you know urban planners. I think when we're looking at commercial real estate now going forward, I think it's important to recognize that some of these leases, they're certainly staggered. They all don't come due at the same time and need to be renewed at the same time. But they're not going to now fall off and, and tenants are going to make decisions now about how much how much space they will need for their workforce and for their operations. So I think that we haven't seen the full impact yet. I think it is likely that over the next five years or so, with additional leases expiring, tenants will try to avoid some of the cost. I think they'll they'll run into this problem of, of having to optimize the the office utilization, because otherwise they'll really deal with a peak demand problem where most of their workforce is in the office, let's say on a Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesday and Wednesday, and then the office is mostly underutilized for the remainder of the day, and you still pay for that underutilized space. So I think going forward, um, leases are going to expire. I think this is going to be a problem for landlords in urban areas. I think it's not going to be a problem for the trophy buildings, for the real high-end real estate, commercial real estate. There's going to be demand for those. There's no question. I think we can see that in some of the um, the urban centers like, like New York City. Um, but going forward, I think then there's the problem of you know housing shortages, increases in housing prices, not enough inventory being added for various reasons on the residential side, and I think some creative creative use um, and create, creative utilization of of this maybe oversupplied office space at that point might be in order to to think about how this could be you know substituted and and rebuilt for some you know residential function. Yeah, and it's the price and the inflation of real estate in total that is a little bit behind the rent inflation. But but also, if you're working from home, you know you don't want to be on top of four roommates. <laughs> so so people are moving 
to bigger places and they're and and they're separating from you know uh situations so that they can work and live from from the same space so this is this is catapulted demand and and so we really haven't seen the that you know hit any kind of equilibrium and as you said you know rates change over time so that inflation you know could potentially continue what for another year yeah i think that's that's definitely true i think you know housing and real estate in general is lumpy it's slow to move it's it takes a while to respond to price effects and as you suggested you you overlay household formation effects you know people during the pandemic that didn't want to be on top of others because there was a risk of you know being infected with covid so they they tried to especially when prices were plummeting in some of the urban areas they were realizing that they could take advantage of of some of that of those some of these price advantages and some of these lower costs but now we're we're sort of on the other side of this so now it's a question of what this means for demand going forward and yeah i think like I said, I think the real estate side of the of the equation is slow to respond, but I think that prices have moved up and they're probably going to continue to do so. Some of the higher financing rates, interest rates are going to put a little bit of a damper on some of those upward trends. But I do think that that's certainly a, a reality for the sector for the for the next foreseeable future. Yeah, and you know, you hear people talk about uh, these buildings. Okay, now we are now we have too few residential buildings and too many commercial buildings. People are, you know, reworking space, uh, you know, in the office, and so therefore, let's just, you know, why don't we just convert these office buildings to residential? But that's easier said than done, isn't it? Yeah, and ab- absolutely. I think that's you know, conceptually, if you if you look at yeah, the space is there, but. It's not, you can't just, you know, install a couple of bathrooms and a shower and there you go. It's much more complicated than that. And, you know, some of these buildings, especially not necessarily the the newly constructed, but the older ones, they come with all kinds of restrictions with it in terms of how they're laid out and designed. That's going to take all kinds of investment to make them, you know, suitable for, for other uses. So I do think those are real challenges. Yeah. And, you know, you're right. I mean, if you think about commercial space, you know, office space, yes, you do have bath, a, a bathroom area. You do have a kitchen area, maybe, but they're wide open floors or they're, they're, they're offices. It doesn't, you know, you, if you're going to put apartments or condos in, I mean, you need you need a kitchen, you know, 10 kitchens a floor. You need 10 or 20 bathrooms per floor. And all of that requires different pipes. So you almost have to strip these buildings down to a core, which is uneconomic, essentially. And so, hence, it's a conundrum for cities. Yeah, I think cities are facing real challenges. They're also facing challenges when it comes to, you know, the environmental side. There are, in many cities around the country in the U.S., there are now there's legislation, there are regulations on the books that basically target the the commercial, not the uh, the building sector in particular when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. There's a lot of need for retrofits in New York City alone. 60% of greenhouse gas emissions come from the building sector. So there's a lot of focus now on turning some of these buildings not only into, let's say, residential um, units from commercial space, but also to do this in a way that you lower the overall environmental footprint of that sector. So I think those are two challenges that come hand in hand and that need to be managed at the same time. Yeah, we're talking about cities and what impact COVID and the change in working environment and the work from home trends all are having on cities today. We're going to sh- take a short break and we'll be right back. As you and your company monitor the latest wave of shocks that have battered the U.S. economy, the award-winning forecast team at the Conference Board now predicts a recession by the end of 2022. This recession will further compound the crises that have recently upended original expectations, from a deadly pandemic to a war in Ukraine and the highest inflation in decades. Yet, unprecedented crises also present unforeseen opportunities if you have a trusted, proven navigator by your side. With that in mind, and as the conference board has always done, we are providing you with daily, timely, and relevant content that will guide the business community through the economic storm. These trusted insights are being gathered on our website and are available to help your company master the challenges ahead. Visit us at conference-board.org slash topics slash recession. Then on November 29th, join us for a live virtual briefing from our economists and other financial experts. It's complimentary to you and your colleagues. 
Register now on our website to hear the latest on weathering this economic turbulence. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, and I'm joined today by Alex Heil, Senior Economist at the Conference Board and an expert in all things cities. Okay, so Alex, we talked about you know, the pandemic, the work from home trends, where we are on that spectrum, you know, the, the imbalance in, in real estate and so forth. But you, you've written a lot about infrastructure and the critical role that infrastructure plays on urban centers. And so all of this, you know, we talked about the, the real estate and the, you know, commercial and residential real estate components. Talk to us about the infrastructure aspects of this. Well, I do think, and you know, this is consistent with my background, is a lot of my research and my interest are in the area of transportation. So I think especially during the pandemic, you know, there was a lot of concern if if public transportation will be able to survive in a post-COVID world. Because even prior to the pandemic, you know, the um the way that some of these transportation agencies were recovering cost, that wasn't full cost recovery. So there was a lot of, you know, fare box. Um, recovery rates were, you know, a third in the best best of cases, maybe half, something like that, supplemented with other revenue sources. And now once ridership collapsed during the pandemic, really one leg was was taken out from from many of those agencies and and their business model was was put into question. So I think going forward, I think it is not so much thinking about, well, what's the old system and how should we be planning for you know, infrastructure in an urban environment going forward. I think it's about what will be what's the new demand going to be? I think what is what are how can we think about an infrastructure in a way that um is actually, you know, utilizing some of these massive um assets in a more in a smarter in a more effective way i think that um just just returning to the old business model is clearly not the way to go i think then if we're taking about some of the and, and this on, only applies that that certainly that point only some of the urban centers that actually are served by public transportation but ridership rates are down that also not only applies to the urban traffic in general when it comes to transit but certainly also some of the feeder trips into an urban area so i do think that the way that capacity is provided is it needs to be rethought. I think it's sort of it's for me personally, it's very ironic because pre-pandemic, the big discussion was, oh, we don't have enough capacity, especially at the peak. And we need to incentivize, we need to nudge people to come out of the peak into the off-peak, into the shoulder periods, because it's too expensive to provide transportation capacity at the peak. Now we're at a, at a situation on the other side of this where peak demand has fallen dramatically is probably still anywhere between 20 and 30 percent on average below what it was pre-pandemic and now solvency and and uh, you know financial sustainability of some of these systems is is the big concern so we've really really turned the corner on and identified um different challenges for some of that infrastructure and the way it's being used yeah, and that's just transportation, but there are a number of other pieces of infrastructure that are important too, right? I mean, there's there's the whole the internet connection, you know, wideband, and now we're going to you know ultra wideband and and having to implement that. We've got the the electric grid um, and the capacity of that. We've got we have water issues all over the country and sewer issues. Talk about the other aspects of infrastructure. Yeah, I think that in general, if we look at infrastructure in this country, I think you know that it, it suffers from uh, underinvestment for years. I do think that as some of these infrastructure categories, there will be additional demands placed on them. I think the energy transition and the extent to which we will need greater electrification, greater transmission capacity not just in urban areas but across the country but certainly some of these problems they are magnified in urban areas where the residential density is much higher than in other parts of the countries i mean if you're just imagining that you know the rate of electrification of buildings is going to increase because that's one way of decarbonizing them then what that means is not only that on the generation side, we need to have more capacity when it comes to energy, electricity generation infrastructure, but also how do we get that electricity in an efficient way, you know, servicing urban centers and buildings, 
and you know other assets that are serving the millions and millions of residents and i think you know the other points that you made are also very valid and sometimes forgotten i think you know water systems sewer systems when i worked in the water and sewer industry my engineering colleagues would always tell me you know the the average water pipe in this country is 100 years old but has a design life of 80 years and i think that is still the problem that's still the problem today and if you're just adding up all these needs for investment they they easily you know sum up into the into the you know tens and hundreds of billions of dollars across the range so that's why i'm saying going forward i think we need to think about how can we provide capacity what's the smartest way to do this and what are the new risks and also the new opportunities when when investing in infrastructure well you know and and then you put electric cars in in this whole um you know this whole objective of decarbonization on on this and you know you mentioned that we have we have an objective to decarbon emissions by 2050 and you know most people may not know uh that one of the one of the huge sources of emission carbon emissions is is commercial real estate commercial structures and building and and so what what impact you know does decarbonization have on cities well it's, I mean, you mentioned commercial real estate. So for, this all comes down to electrification. And then electrification basically means that systems, buildings, commercial structures, they run on electricity and they run less on fossil fuels or on steam. And as a result of that, I think you know, there's a different demand pattern that will emerge. There's certainly a summer peak that arises as a result of this, because in the summertime when it's hot, everybody turns on the air, air conditioning, there's other electricity demand that comes along with it, and that creates tremendous spikes. And some of these systems and transition, transmission infrastructure in general is not up to the challenge of managing some of that peak demand. We've seen it in California over the summer during the trees, tremendous um, periods of high temperatures. But there's also another side to this, because if you electrify, then you have to deal with the winter peak. And the winter peak basically, you know, suggests that if you're turning your, your heating into you know, um, an electric electric demand issue, then in case of a blackout, it's going to get awfully cold in some of these commercial, um, you know, these some of these commercial assets. So I do think that adding electrification is the way to decarbonize, but we also need to do this in a way that we minimize some of the risk, and certainly also need to look at the underlying um, electricity generation in states and in the country overall, because it, it, it's no use. It's not, it's not really good to electrify across the board. When you're feeding then the newly electrified buildings with electricity that comes in large part from fossil fuels, so I think all these developments need to come hand in hand. Yeah, you know some of these buildings. It's it's easier said than done, but some of these buildings that that are old, you know, are not energy efficient. You know, windows would need to be replaced. Um, you know, the internal systems need to be replaced. There's asbestos in them. There's lead in the piping and all these kinds. Of, so retrofitting these things to get to a carbon-free world is expensive so how much then do you see this this whole move potentially moving people out of city centers into more let's just call it greener fields <laughs> meaning you know uh, greener spaces greener uh, you know buildings and so forth that are cheaper to build you know in in non dense urban areas well, so first off, I think in terms of the retrofits that are required, I think it's important to to realize that we should really be doing this in a way that we maximize and optimize greenhouse gas emissions on a per dollar spent basis. So, you know, using cost benefit analysis across the board to identify the buildings that are cheaper to retrofit and to lower greenhouse gas emissions from is one way to go. So in other words, an old multi, you know, large, let's say, you know, residential building, large commercial building in which you regulate the temperature by opening the window, there are probably some low-hanging fruits that can be achieved rather rapidly in order to improve efficiency. On the new infrastructure, the buildings that were just built over the last few years, and they are LEED certified, and they come with with various you know equipment and technology to already save energy today getting to the next level for them is going to be much more expensive so 
thinking about this as an optimization process, I think is important. And then in terms of you know the the relocation to greener, more sustainable environments, I do think that certainly for, happened. It happened for other reasons during the pandemic when people saw more space, essentially. But it's also a question of you know density is is our friend with some of these effects because density also means that you can do a lot with uh you know economies of scale and you can you can have greater leverage when it comes to the impacts of some of these investments but i do think that you know some of the trend of moving to the suburbs moving to low cost cities that is going to continue and initially that might have been for cost reasons and that's still for cost reasons actually now but i think also thinking about this from the point of view of w- what are some areas in which one can live in a more sustainable way rather than and and avoid some of these massive costs of having to deal with uh, you know reduction ex- investments and expenditures that might be some way to go but i think that's also still a ways off so if, if you kind of try to summarize all of this to close then alex you've got these macro forces work from home forces requirements of decarbonization the expense required for retrofitting buildings and infrastructure. Where do you net out then on these dense urban areas versus, you know, so are cities going to, dense urban areas going to thrive because of this or are they going to decline and we're going to see a dispersion back out? How do you, you know, what's the future based on all of that? I think that cities are going to continue to thrive. I do think that some of these advantages will continue to provide dividends for residents, private households, as well as businesses. I think agglomeration, allowing for labor markets to be dense and, and deep in order for employers to seek out the best, most talented workforce for them, that can be most efficiently done in an urban environment. I do think that amenities, quality of life, that can also be done you know, in cities in a way that it can optimize and, and play to the advantage of residents. I do think that that doesn't come without challenges, though. I think that you know, in some urban areas, there's certainly been an uptick in crime. That's what some of the data suggested, which is which has been problematic for some of these uh, sort of older cities in particular. And I do think some of these environmental impacts are going to be problematic for some of these these metropolitan areas going forward. So I do think in a sense, there's almost going to be more competition between cities. I think cities, you know, in the abstract are going to realize that in order to attract residents, meaning workers at the end, and businesses, they need to be able to to dynamically respond to some of these some of these new trends in demand, some of these new preferences, and these new needs for businesses to to relocate and to uh, to situate themselves in order to to take best advantage of them. And I think we're at the beginning of that. And um, you know, competition generally can be good when it comes to this, but I do think that you know with some winners that come out of this as the true you know beneficiaries for some of these these reurbanization trends in different ways at different equilibrium points there will also be other cities that are probably going to be suffering and are going to be the losers of that equation all right well alex heil thanks so much for joining us today and talking about the future of cities thanks so much steve it's been a pleasure and thanks to all of you for listening in to ceo perspectives every week i'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover leading topics in geopolitics, economics, public policy, ESG, and more. Please share CEO perspectives with your colleagues, with your friends, with your family, with all those in dense urban areas. We know they're gonna wanna listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this series has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, the indispensable ally that has helped businesses through war, recession, and economic transformation since our founding in 1916. As recent unexpected economic challenges persist, you can find the latest and most trusted insights for what's ahead on our website. Please join us on November 29th for a live global virtual briefing from our award-winning economists and other financial experts. 
Get the latest thinking in how to best weather the economic turbulence by registering for this free briefing at conference-board.org slash topics slash recession.